Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 8, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussions following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We discuss what we've learned from the various state candidate interviews in the papers this past week as we run up to next week's primary. Second, we explain why we believe under ranked choice voting, it's very important who comes in fourth in the primary for governor. And third, we discuss the most recent example which demonstrates that Governor Dunleavy isn't really that serious about holding the line on spending. And now, Let's join Michael. Well, Brad, let's uh, let's kick things off and get stuff started here this morning. Uh, we got the weekly uh, top three. Number one is all the things that we have learned uh, <laughs> from the state candidate interviews. And there's a bunch of stuff going on. There's a bunch of interviews that have been floating around. ADN has got some, the Beacon, some of the other ones. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you've learned uh, from the state candidate interviews for governor, for senator, blah, 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 the whole thing. Let's just give me some rundown here. Well, the Beacon has got interviews with uh, with uh, governor candidates, the gubernatorial candidates, Senate, state Senate candidates, and state House candidates that responded. Uh, the ADN's got uh, interviews with the gubernatorial candidates uh, that responded. And those have both uh, uh, been interesting reading. I think the overall assessment that I came away from reading it is disappointment. Uh, There doesn't seem to be a consensus around, it's not not surprising disappointment, I guess, but but disappointment. There doesn't seem to be a consensus around uh, any sort of approach on fiscal policy. Uh, It's still, we still seem to be in the stage six years later, six years after PFDs were first cut, and we still seem to be in the the cycle of, uh, of my way, I'm going to win with my way, and and I'm not going to compromise one inch. Um, and, and and so you you really don't see a consensus. What I was hoping for, what I was looking for, uh, was a consensus around uh, around uh, around the issue, and and you know being able to identify candidates that that if put together in a, in the legislature would uh, uh, would uh, uh, be able to bring uh, forth a policy. Most disappointing, I think. Um, was the was the limited mention of the fiscal policy working group and the recommendations made by the fiscal policy working group? Two Senate candidates who responded to the to the questionnaires, uh, Rob Myers uh, and Jesse Keel, uh, endorsed uh, the fiscal policy working group. It's not surprising for Jesse; he was on it. Uh, Rob's endorsement, I th- I think, is a is a great sign, and I was and I was really encouraged by that. And since I read his early on, I was sort of I was sort of hoping it was going to start a trend, uh, but it didn't. Um, a few more House candidates uh, endorsed the fiscal policy working group, but but mostly they were they were Democrats uh, or independents. Uh, Dan Ortiz uh, uh, endorsed it. Uh, others uh, endorsed it as as you went through, uh, but there was very there was very little recognition even of the work of the fiscal policy working group much less uh, much less endorsement uh, of the recommendations the rest of it was as you would sort of expect uh, 
some who said we're going to cut our way, cut government spending down to uh, to match uh, revenues. Uh, some Andy Josephson was the worst in this crowd. Andy Josephson who said, "Ah, eh, PFD is whatever, <laughs> whatever we say it is, and it's whatever's left over after we fund government." <laughs> wow. Um, just, yeah, he was very he was very blatant in that just, regard. Just throw it right out there. I don't want your vote. I mean, it's fine. Go ahead. Uh, that'll work. <laughs> Uh, well, it was clearly an appeal to uh, to uh, uh, those who uh, those who are tied to the government sector of the of the economy. Um, some candidates uh, recognized the uh, what I call the who pays issue. Who bears the burden of of uh, of, of fiscal policy if uh, if we if we fund government through PFD cuts? Some candidates recognized that it was a regressive. Uh, uh, tax on middle and lower income Alaska families, but, but, but <laughs> very few of them sort of went on and said, then we got to come to some solution. The solution should be the fiscal policy working group. Um, so it was, it was a lot of, yeah, that's a problem. Uh, we really got to deal with it. Here's, uh, here's where I think we ought to land either spending cuts or, or, uh, 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 you know, just Andy Josephson's uh, all the way from spending cuts all the way to Andy Josephson's whatever's whatever's left over. Um, uh, some can one candidate said uh, uh, it, it could even go to zero, um, and and he would and that candidate would be fine with that. So it's uh, it, it was a disappointing uh, uh, mashup on on that issue. I, I I would say that there was a lot more a lot more enthusiasm. Uh, among the various candidates for spending, uh, various spending priorities, both Democrats and Republicans. The Democrats tended to say, uh, we've got to uh, uh, fu fu fund uh, government employees. We've got to develop pensions for them. We've got to make sure that their pay is, is competitive. Uh, that's the solution that we, that we need to come to. Um, some talked about education in particular, uh, better funding education, building up education, both at the K through 12 level as well as the uh, as well as the university uh, level. Uh, not unsurprisingly, um, uh, the uh, uh, candidates uh, up in Adam Wool's old district and Fairbanks, which represents UAF, were all about we have to fully fund UAF. We have to make sure that UAF is taken care of. Weren't those cuts that Governor Dunleavy proposed horrible? Right. Uh, uh, we have to we have to balance those out. Uh, a lot of, of discussion about on the Democrat side about uh, about uh, pensions and about uh, uh, employees and about uh, uh, education funding. On the Republican side, uh, there was a lot of discussion about infrastructure funding, uh, and we need to uh, we need to fund uh, infrastructure. Some candidates uh, were very clear that uh, no, there were no no taxes, even if it meant PFD cuts. Dan Sadler, surprisingly. Uh, said uh, we need to we need to take care of the PFD, but but not if it means taxes, right? Uh, and so uh, put himself uh, put himself in that camp of of uh, cutting uh, cutting middle and cutting revenues to middle or, or taking revenues from middle and lower income Alaska families and not spreading it more equitably. Um, but I but in general, Michael, I, I would say that uh, that you don't you don't read these interviews and come away with the feeling that, okay, we're on our way to a solution. We've got, we've got a consensus building around certain proposals and we're going to, and, and this crop of legislators are going to, uh, are going to advance us toward that. Same thing's true in the governor's race. I mean, the, it, it, Governor Dunleavy said, we're going to, we're going to propose 50, 50 out on the, on the, as a constitutional amendment, if I can get it through the legislature, we're going to propose 50, 50. That's uh, that's my solution. Uh, Les Guerra said we're going to tax the oil companies. Uh, Louis Flora down at uh, Homer said the same thing. We're going to tax the oil companies. That's the way we're going to. That's the way we're going to resolve uh, our fiscal issues. And Walker, uh, Walker, you know, for good, bad, or indifferent, is, is stay in the course. Walker said uh, uh, we're going to build the PF. We're going to build the permanent fund through PFD cuts. Uh, and at some point, we're going to get out there to Nirvana. Where we can just fund government entirely off the earnings from from the the permanent fund, uh, permanent the earnings off the permanent fund. Yeah, well, I mean that is the ultimate uh, that is the ultimate wet dream of a lot of these politicians who are so pro government. They just can't wait till the day that the fund hits a hundred million dollars plus hundred billion dollars plus and just spins off 
five or six billion a year. They just can't wait for that day. Yeah, it, it used to be a hundred billion dollars was going to be the was going to be Nirvana, and now Walker in Walker's interview he mentions one hundred and twenty billion dollars. So that that number keeps growing bigger uh, in order to to in order to uh, fund more government. But you know what that means? It, it means that you have to cut the PFD now. His proposal is to cut the PFD now to a sustainable, affordable level. We have to cut the PFD now, and and once you get out to this Nirvana, you still have to cut the PFD. Because you're taking all of the earnings off of the permanent fund uh, to fund uh, to fund government. I mean, that's that's their goal to get to get the permanent fund to a level where they can where they can fund government off of it. And the PFD is a is a is an afterthought uh, in that in that uh, in that process. So it's you know the the, the gubernatorial candidates uh, really aren't coming to grips with it. I I was hoping that one of the gubernatorial candidates would step up and say, fiscal policy working group, we're going to build around that. We had we have a solution out there. It's still somewhat nebulous, but we're going to build around that. None of them did that. None of them even mentioned it. So I think um I I think the in 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 large part the interviews uh reflected where we've been uh and uh and and lead one with the impression that we're just going to continue to muddle muddle along, which means continue PFD cuts. We're going to continue to muddle along, uh, even with this crop, uh, even, even, you know, looking at this crop coming, uh, yeah, into the legislature after this election. Well, it's interesting, you know, again, the roadmap, and we, we keep coming back to this, and I don't mean to be a broken record, but we keep coming back to the fiscal policy working group. I mean, you know, you got somebody like Rob Meyer, who I would consider to be one of the most conservative members of the Senate and Jesse Keel both saying, here's a roadmap. Jesse Keel being on the opposite side of the political spectrum. Here's a roadmap that we can work with. We've heard other people, Kevin McCabe and Mike Schauer and others mention this and say, here is something that we can use as a blueprint. And the fact that not everybody is you know, is pulling, it just, it, it just shocks me that, that, uh, this is just laying there. It, it proves to me that in a lot of ways, there are many people out there, they don't really want to fix this problem. They, they don't see it as a problem. The, the, the problem for them is how do we get rid of the PFD and use it for government spending without angering the electorate? Yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's more than that because you're seeing it on both the left and right. It's not, it's not just how do we get, how do we continue to use it for government spending or in Walker's case, how do we, you know, cut it now and cut it later and, 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 you know, have this nirvana of government funded off the permanent fund. It's more than that. Even on the right, you're seeing, you know, people stick to the, we're going to cut our way. We're going to cut government spending down to, down to whatever it takes to, you know, fully fund the PFD. And, and that's, you know, we saw that in 2019, that's just not going to happen. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's this absence on both the left and the right. I mean, maybe, maybe what we're seeing is we've got a core group that is endorsing the fiscal policy working group. We've got a core group that really, you know, views this as a multifaceted issue that needs to be addressed in a number of different ways. And they're going to continue to, and and they're con committed to continuing to work down that road. And maybe what they do is once the legislature starts is they pull in people from, from the two sides toward that middle and, and, uh, and coalesce around it. Maybe that's where, Maybe that's where this works. So as long as you have a core group believing in the fiscal policy working group uh, or the proposal there, uh, maybe that's maybe that's really you know something that you should just accept as a win and and go on. But none of the governor candidates, I mean, uh, not Dunleavy, not Walker, not Less, uh, uh, mentioned it at all. Uh, did and Char um, did Charlie Pierce mention it at all? I'm just curious. Charlie Pierce didn't respond. <laughs> didn't respond to the interview. Okay, all right, I see. Okay. So. So I don't, and, and, and Kirka, uh, Kirka just said, we're essentially, we're going to cut our way there. So, um, it, it it's, um, it, I, I was hoping for a bigger recognition that we'd made progress with the fiscal policy working group. And in some candidates, uh, we see that both left and right. Uh, you can't get much more left than Jesse Keel, uh, in the Senate. You can't get much more right than, than Rob Myers uh, in the Senate. And to see those two uh, working, you know, both recognizing that the fiscal policy working group had a recommendation out there, that's encouraging. Um, you see, uh, but you don't see that same sort of left and right 
uh, in the in the House. As I say, uh, the ones who mentioned the fiscal policy working group were largely Democrats or independents. Uh, re- very few Republicans responded, but the Republicans that did respond, very I can't recall any of those uh, mentioning the fiscal policy working group as a, as a way forward. So it's um, for somebody who was hoping, for me, who was hoping to see uh, a, a more, uh, a fuller recognition, a more broad recognition of the efforts of the fiscal policy working group and sort of their recognition that it's a multifaceted po- pol- or a multifaceted problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, the interviews were uh, were disappointing. Here's Chris says in Twitch. He says no progress on the working group plan. That is fake news. None of the shot callers supported it. If they did, they would have acted on it already. And I don't know if it's fake news, but it is. I mean, it is. You're not wrong. The shot callers, meaning the the leadership of the legislature, did not support it. And so it really didn't go anywhere, even though it seems to be the consensus of both sides of the aisle, Brad. Well, the first, the, the, the reason the fiscal policy working group is important is because uh, it did have uh, buy in from both the, the left side of the legislature and the right side of the legislature, uh, as well as some some who could say, who could be said to be uh, in the center. Um, so it was a consensus formed out of, you know, trying to trying to find a way to mesh all of these uh, positions together. Yeah, leadership didn't like it, um, but, you know, we're having an election and we have elections to try to, you know, to form new leadership or to form new uh, directions for the legislature and for the governor's office. That's why we have elections. So the hope is that in the election process, we elect more people uh, who, Want to drive toward uh, want to drive to toward a, toward a consensus and uh, and uh, uh, it, it build a consensus around the fiscal policy working group. Look, we need to face we need to face up to something. If we don't have a consensus on the way forward, the legislature is going to continue PFD cuts. Status quo means continued and deeper as we as oil prices come down uh, uh, and oil revenues come come down. Uh, status quo is going to mean continued PFD cuts. There needs we need to find an alternative to an alternative direction. Uh, if uh, if you believe as I do at least that the PFD cuts are the worst uh, approach that you possibly can take. So uh, fiscal policy working group yeah it didn't have the le- the buy in of leadership, um, uh, <laughs> but but we're having an election. The election is to is to hopefully find new directions and. Uh, and and looking for people who are buying into uh, uh, looking for people who are buying into the fiscal policy working group. You know, one could hope that uh, in the next legislature, uh, once the Senate is reformed and once the uh, 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 House is reformed, that uh, at least on the Senate side, maybe Jesse Keel and Rob Myers are in their respective parties' leaderships, uh, and uh, and and they have you know indicated a. a, a a, a recognition that the fiscal policy working group is a good way forward. So the fact it didn't happen in the last legislature, that's old news. Right. The question is the question is what happens going forward. Right. I mean, now that all the work is done, you don't want to have to create another, you know, fiscal policy. You've already done it. I mean, just acknowledge the plan that's there and discuss the merits of that one before you move on uh, anywhere else. I see Michael on Facebook has said something, which I am seeing more and more discussed by many of the, uh, uh, more progressive candidates, which is one of the candidates on the peninsula is saying he's going to get the defined benefits retirement plan reinstated. That again is another goalpost dream for many of these progressives. They just can't wait to get that. I mean, I don't know if they just can't do basic math and understand, you know, how far underwater we were with the defined benefits uh, retirement plan before the tier one plan. But uh, I mean, this is dangerous talk in my opinion. Oh, we're still underwater. We're still underwater. Uh, you know, we're, we've, we're only 70 or 80 percent funded. Right. Even after even after the stock market run up uh, of the past few years, we're only 78 or 80 percent funded uh, uh, on our retirement. You know, people people say, well, we're going to set up this defined benefits differently. We're going to set it up to pay for itself. We're not going to have uh, uh, we're not going to have the kind of uh, exposure. <laughs> we got a We got a, somebody mowing a yard back here. We're not going to have the kind of uh, exposure that um, uh, financial exposure that we've had in the past uh, and we're going to uh, uh, we're going to we're going to set it up so it pays for itself but that never happens right 
Right. I mean, you get two or three, you, that's your intent at the beginning, but you get two or three years or four years down the road. And all of a sudden, ah, we don't want to pay that much for the for defined benefits. We don't want to contribute that much to defined benefits. And then the stock market starts getting a little wavery. Uh, and, and the difference between defined benefits and defined contribution is who takes the risk. In defined benefits, the state takes the risk. In defined contribution, the contributors uh, uh, take the risk of, of, of the market wavering. And you, you get two or three or four years down the road or five or 10 years down the road, the market wavers a little bit. It wavers from the expectations you had uh, at the time you set the rates. So you get pushed back on the rates and the market doesn't, doesn't fulfill your expectations. And all of a sudden the state's on the hook, the state who's taking the risk and defined benefit programs on the, on the hook. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We are uh, working uh, towards our number two, which uh, uh, hopefully we're going to have time for all three today. But number two is going to be why the fourth place uh, in the governor's race matters under ranked choice voting. Give me a 60 second uh, thumbnail here, Brad. Well, we talked about this last week during one of the breaks, um, and I thought it was important enough to go back and hit it again uh, uh, in the uh, in the discussion uh, during, uh, uh, during airtime, uh, to talk about why I think at least, uh, the fourth place matters and why it matters a lot, uh, in, the, in the outcome, uh, of this election. And, um, uh, and so we're going to talk about it again once we come back on air. All right. We're continuing now, Brad Keithley, uh, our guest, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. It's the weekly top three. Why the fourth place in the governor's race actually matters. Everybody's talking about Dunleavy and Walker and Gara, but the fourth position is going to be important as well. Brad, we did talk about this a little bit last week. Uh, give us your take uh, on this uh, as we go forward here. Well, in ranked choice voting, I think the fourth place uh, uh, has the potential uh, to determine the outcome of the election. Um, and the, the, the second choice uh, votes for the fourth place candidate once we get to ranked choice voting. And I think it's I think it's very important who that fourth uh, ranked candidate is and what his voters are likely to do, what that person's voters are likely to do uh, with their second with their second choice ballots. I say that because when we saw as we saw with the Ivan Moore poll and as we've seen with additional polls since, uh, Walker or Dunleavy is, is ahead uh, in November. Uh, Gara and Walker are close. Um, so you take the, the fourth, the fourth, uh, close to each other. You take the fourth, uh, ranked candidate, you throw, uh, you, you, you eliminate his votes, his first, first choice votes. When you get to ranked choice voting, you take his second choice, that candidate, second choice votes, and then you reapply them. Uh, in the Ivan Moore poll, that was enough to push Walker or push Dunleavy rather. Uh, over the top, over over fifty uh, percent, and I think that's probably how it's going to play out um, in uh, November. If enough people are ranking uh, Dunleavy in uh, in second as the second choice uh, on their ballots, here's where I think it's important. I don't think I, when you look at Pierce and Kirka, who are the two leading contenders for fourth place, I think the Pierce voters, people who who would vote for Charlie Pierce, are a lot more likely to rank Dunleavy second uh, than, uh, than, uh, 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 than not. And, and set up that situation when we get to November and we get to rank choice voting, where those second choice ballots from the fourth ranked candidate uh, end up pushing uh, uh, Dunleavy over. Y we can hope that Charlie, you know, that Charlie does even, even better than that uh, as the election gets on, as the, as the focus turns to those four candidates, as opposed to being spread uh, among a, a number of candidates. But, but I think it's I think it's important that 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 fourth choice candidate or that fourth uh, ballot candidate be 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 Charlie Kirka. On the other hand, I think his voters are a lot more likely to be what's what's being called bullet voters, and bullet voters are voters that vote for one candidate and then stop marking their ballot. One and done, right? One and done. And if you have that, uh, if if the fourth ranked candidate, if the fourth candidate in the in the ranked choice voting in November, if you have a lot of bullet voters for that fourth uh, uh, choice candidate, their second choices may not be enough. The few who, who are the ones who market second choice may not be enough to push the, to push Dunleavy or, or whoever, hopefully, Dun, uh, hopefully a conservative candidate uh, over the top. 
Um, so I think it's really critical who's in that fourth, who's in that fourth spot. Will it be a candidate who's attracting voters who are going to mark the down, who's going to, who are going to mark a second, uh, second, uh, choice, or will it be a candidate who's going to attract voters who are bullet voters and not, not mark that second choice? I think that's critical enough, frankly, that I think some people who otherwise might be inclined to vote for Dunleavy, uh, on the first ballot should, should can reconsider and consider voting for Charlie uh, uh, in uh, in the primary to p- to put him in a position to be that fourth uh, fourth ranked candidate. Um, I certainly intend to vote for Charlie uh, in, uh, in in the primary. Right uh, for that for that reason among others, I like his positions uh, uh, generally as well. But but I think it's I think it's important that people consider when they when they go into the ballot since you only get one vote in the August primary when the, when you go in to vote that you consider voting not only for the candidate that you favor, but, but consider putting a candidate, how your vote would impact putting a candidate uh, in that fourth, uh, in that fourth place position. And uh, somebody just said, I was going to rank Kirk Pierce and then Dunleavy. The problem is again, assuming that the three of them are in the rank choice portion. And that's the problem is that there's, you know, with all the oxygen being in the room sucked up by, uh, 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 Dunleavy and Guerra and Walker, uh, that fourth position, there's only going to be four. So it's either going to be, I think at this point, it's going to be Kirka or Pierce. And, uh, and you're right. I think the Kirka voters are all so done with uh, Mike Dunleavy that they're not even going to bother to vote, uh, at that point for anybody else. We need to make sure that we, I said, I've been ranking, I'm going to rank the red and the yellow. I'm going to rank the, the, the Republican uh, candidates and Libertarian candidates, even if I have to write them in, I'm not placing a vote for <clears throat> Walker or Guerra or for any other Democrat in the race thus far. And that's just how it's got to be. But you can't just be a one vote, one vote ticket. Yeah. And Michael, keep in mind that that the whole rank choice is in November. The, the, the primary, the August primary right. in the governor's race is one vote. You get one vote. And, and the question is how you want to use that one vote. And, the, and, and to me, the question is, do you want to vote just for the candidate you, 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 you favor most, the candidate you think is going to finish first, or do you want to think more strategically and, and, and use that vote to help position somebody in the fourth position that's going to be hugely important when we get, uh, when we get to, to November? Right. So I, it, it's, um, I, I understand people who say, well, I'm going to rank so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. We're not there yet. Don't worry about that yet. Don't think about that yet. Right. <laughs> think about think about August and you only get one vote. And how do you want to use that vote uh, to protect yourself in, from, in, in what you want to do when, once you get to November? I, and I, again, I agree. I think that that's important. It's one of the reasons why I am... Uh... It's one of the reasons why I'm voting Charlie Pierce in August, just to simply one, because I like you, I like his policies and I'd like to see him be governor. And two, he's the best of the remaining candidates to be in the top four to uh, make sure that there is at least a Republican governor, if nothing else, when it's all said and done. I, uh, <clears throat> I, I like this. Somebody just said in the chat room, going back to your number two, talking about the fourth, uh, talking about the fourth uh, candidate in the rank choice. Uh, Rick says, strange didn't we used to only get one vote so if i vote for one candidate and they don't make it so why should i put someone in second place when i don't want them in office the whole thing is a setup for disaster well look it's the law of the land now and you have to think of it like this is immediate runoff this is like an immediate runoff race is what it, it you have to kind of consider it in that regard and would you rather have would you rather be able to vote for two candidates one that you like and one that you kind of like or Again, the lesser of two evils, um, and be able to do it all at once. I mean, I, I I think if you're voting for just one candidate and going, you're missing an opportunity here uh, to again uh, at least keep some semblance of conservatism in the state government at this point, Brad. Well, if you're voting for Dunleavy, I mean, uh, taking the polls um, and 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 assuming that's sort of where we're headed to in November. If you're voting for Dunleavy, you probably can do one and done because he's probably not going to be the fourth the fourth candidate. He's probably not going to be the one where second choice votes, uh, votes matter. But if you're voting for Kirka or Charlie, uh, if we come to November and, and one of them are, are the fourth candidate, fourth candidate coming out of the primary, and you don't do a second vote for them, essentially, 
you're voting for Walker and Guerra. <laughs> because if Dunleavy doesn't make it to 50 percent uh, uh, after the after the fourth, if he doesn't make it to 50 percent in the first round and he doesn't make it to 50 percent after the second round, then you're going to have Guerra or, or Walker's votes, most of whom are going to vote for the other right. as their second choice. You're right. going to have those votes determining the outcome. And it's likely it's likely going to push one of them over the top. So, yeah, one and done is is probably fine if you're voting for Dunleavy, but one and done if you're voting if the fourth candidate is is Pierce or Kirka, and you do and you vote one one and done, you're essentially voting uh, for uh, for Guerra or Walker uh, uh, in uh, in that in in what would subsequently be the second round, third round. Right, right, and that's the thing is when it gets down into the third round, that's when things really get dicey because. Again, by that point, especially if you've got two candidates that are close to each other, like Gara and Walker, those votes essentially combine at some point, and uh, and that's a and that's a uh, and that's a problem when it's all said and done. Um, <clears throat> if Walker or Gara get elected, they will punish the Republican donor class. I think they're gonna they'll just punish the state in general. <laughs> I don't think it'll be specifically the donor class. I think they want to court the donor class, but uh, you know, I think it'll just be the state in general. Oh no, the 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 Republican donor class is over supporting uh, 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 Walker. Look at Jim Jansen. Look at Kathy Geisel. Look look at look at look at the Republicans. The big money Repu Look at Ron Duncan. Look at the big money Republicans. They're over supporting Walker. The, why? Because Walker is going to use PFD cuts to finance government. He's going to have big government, but do it on the back of middle and lower income Alaska families. He's not going to tax. He's not going to tax the top 20 percent. They're there. They're there. They're already there. Guerra, less significantly less so. But that donor class, that that establishment donor class is already behind Walker. He isn't he isn't going to punish them at all. Right. In fact, he, he's setting up his policies to work for them. Right. Um, Brad, that uh, leaves us to number three um, today, which, of course, is uh, just more proof that Dunleavy is not really about the uh, the minimal small budget. After all, you've got more more proof yet laid out again. Well, we uh, we saw in 2019 that the that, that governor Dunleavy did try to cut spending. Uh, he was. Uh, he, he came out with a budget that I think uh, a lot of people uh, who listen to this program uh, supported, uh, and, uh, and he pushed uh, the cuts, the type of cuts that, that, that people have talked about. But it didn't succeed. And in the end, it, wouldn't, it didn't even get 16 legislators who were willing to back him up. Uh, had, he made those, had he made the vetoes down to the levels that he originally proposed, he didn't have 16 legislators who would back him up. Uh, on that level of cuts. Um, so it's, we've tried that. It didn't work. Um, and what's happened since is I think Dunleavy just sort of threw in the towel and said, okay, well, that's not going to go anyplace. And it's going to get, going to get recall petitions filed against me. And it's probably going to lose me the election. And, and so he sort of, he sort of wandered over to the other side, not all the way over to the other side. He's not, you know, full throated, Let's do defined benefits. Let's increase K through 12 spending. Let's, you know, fully fund the universities. Let's do this and that and that spending. He's not all the way over there, but he sort of wandered into the middle ground of, yeah, okay, I'm not going to fight spending uh, all that much. The, the latest evidence of that, uh, I think, was, was him allowing a bill that raised the salaries uh, of essentially the lawyers in government, the, the, the attorney general, the lawyers in the attorney general's office, the lawyers that work for the court system, turns out legislative staffers as well, raised those salaries. He allowed that bill, uh, it's about a $35 million, $40, $40 million price tag uh, on those increases. He allowed that bill to become law uh, without, without signing it. A bill can become law one of two ways. It can either become law uh, with the governor signing it, or it can become law after the passage of a certain amount of time. Uh, with the governor not signing it, not not vetoing it, and not and, and even though he doesn't sign it, it nevertheless becomes law. And uh, and this past week, the governor allowed that bill to become law. There wasn't he didn't give any publicity to it. He didn't he didn't have a signing ceremony, but he also didn't say, look, you know, sometimes we have to fund government. He didn't use it as an opportunity to say sometimes we have to fund fund government, but we don't have to fund government always, and use it as an opportunity to resend 
sort of his uh, spending cut message. He didn't he didn't use it right. for that uh, okay. either. He, in fact, they said something like, "Well, something like this doesn't really need a signing ceremony." Or so I mean, it was just like, that, "Really? That was your it didn't really need a signing ceremony, so you're just going to let it go?" I mean, so so those people who who continue to say we're going to cut spending. I mean, my point ultimately on this is people who continue to say we're going to cut spending down to, you know, the level that we have traditional revenues to cover and we're not going to uh we're not going to uh, uh you know, we're not going to have a need for PFD cuts because we're going to cut spending down to the levels where we can afford uh full PFDs. That's just not going to happen. I just had to laugh at the way that they put that in there. Like, oh, so he couldn't be bothered to cut it because, well, but, you know, he didn't really need a signing ceremony. So, I mean, again, like you said, he's completely rolled over and wet on himself at this point, it seems like. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's just, you know, throwing his hand up in the air and says, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Just just don't, uh, just don't unelect me. Well, yeah, he, that's exactly right. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as that analogy, but but uh, for, for example, what he did earlier after the legislature finished with the budget, he did veto some bonuses that the legislature had passed, included in the appropriations bill, to these same people that, that, that are now getting the, the subsequent legislation that, that this legislation gave, gave raises to. So he did say, I'm not going to double dip. I'm not going to give them bonuses and agree to this increased spending. I'm going to agree to the increased spending uh, and veto uh, veto the bonuses. So he gets he gets some credit for that, but it's not it's not the Dunleavy that we thought we had in 2018. It's not the Dunleavy he's going to come in with a red pen and and rip rip the budget apart uh, in order to get spending down to levels that accommodate uh, accommodate the PFD without other other types of revenue. And and people who keep saying that, people who keep digging in their heels and say, "Well, I'm not going to agree to anything," you know, until we get spending down to to, to those levels. All they're doing, I mean, Dunleavy's not going to do that. All all that attitude is doing is prolonging PFD cuts, because the legislature is not going to do anything else without a consensus to move forward, like we have with the fiscal policy working group. The legislature is not going to do anything other than PFD cuts, uh, and and. And and all we're doing is, you know, taking that attitude of we got to cut spending first or I'm going to hold my breath until we cut spending. All that all that attitude is doing is prolonging PFD cuts. And and this latest episode with Dunleavy, this latest episode by the governor where he just allowed uh, these pay raises to go into effect is another example of that. Yeah. Matter, what are you watching for this week real quick here? Well, we're in the final week before uh, before the primary. I'll be watching stuff that. Uh, that comes out of that we any additional candidate interviews i'll be i'll be uh, digging into uh looking at the uh, last minute policies and then last minute policy approaches and then i've got to make up my mind about uh, about the house race i mean we're who, who to vote for in the house race i it, it, that's a crazy that's a crazy uh, uh mix that we've got going in there and i and i'm not clear in my mind who uh who i'm going to vote for in that so it'll yeah. be uh, i'll be focused on that all right. Well, Brad, we look forward to it next week. Enjoy uh, your time and down there in sunny uh, USA down there. Thanks for coming on board and uh, appreciate it. And uh, as always, look forward to talking to you again next week. Michael, as always, thanks for having me.